Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Game Alone's podcast. I'm so excited for today's guest. We've got Sanjay Malkit from Savoy's Properties. Now, before I get into this, I'm going to read out some stats because these things are impressive numbers here. So Savoy Properties was started 1st of April 2020. Now, for those of you that know your history, you know that was a pretty difficult time here in the UK. And in that time, They've managed to build up a portfolio with 500 tenants. They've won three awards. They've got 100 five-star, over 100 five-star Google reviews. And, and I found this most impressive, you've become business partners with a premiership football club in, in Watford. Guys, welcome to the show. Um, I think you might be our most impressive guests yet. This is insane. Hey, thanks for having us, Sam. No, good, good to have you here. I mean, look, I've, I've got to start off with the obvious question, um, you know, Give us your your sort of views on on the last two years, how you've managed to turn go from basically zero to you know what you're doing now in in such a short period of time in in such such difficult times. So um, just a little background on myself. Myself and Sanjay have been school friends since the age of eleven. Uh, we've been in property together for over twenty years. Um, it was a natural progression towards setting our own business up where we sort of branded um, and had tenants under one sort of uh, name. And then we had clients that were coming to us under a certain brand. So what happened was at the uh, the back end of 2019, myself and Sanjay decided to uh, that we should venture down creating our own little enterprise. However, we didn't anticipate by the time our, of our start date that we were going to be in a, in a pandemic and probably the, the worst circumstances to start. Yeah, I've been look, I'm happy to, to get Sanjay's views on this as well. I know from first-hand experience starting a, a business in uh, in lockdown was tricky, but I think for me, what made it relatively relatively simple really was that I can do what I can I do from anywhere in the world. I, I could do things remotely. It didn't really actually have too much of an, of an impact on what I do on a day-to-day basis, but for you guys, you know, you work in bricks and mortar. So that must have been quite tricky to, to start things, right? Um, to be honest with you, because there's two of us, it's, it sort of helps us out because then we can sort of delegate um, different tasks to each other and take responsibility and ownership over it. So I think, um, obviously, it was lockdown. We were at home. We couldn't really go anywhere. So it's probably worked out quite well for us. Um, we let the system that we use for um, tenants and um and and it was probably I think it fit in at the right time, but it is hard. Don't get me wrong, it is hard because what what happened was we stopped looking at sites and doing what we were doing on a daily basis, <clears throat> and concentrate on the back end rather than rather than the front. But um, yeah, it was interesting. Yeah, it's been it's been a it's been an impressive impressive couple of years for sure. But look for 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 those that are are listening in that maybe haven't come across you before. I mean, firstly, you know what, what are you doing? Um, but um, um, for those, yeah, for those that haven't really sort of come across you guys before, just talk talk me through kind of the, the fundamentals of your business because there are a, a few different facets to it, aren't there? Yeah, so primarily we're a property developer, so we've been developing properties even before Savoy's um, from uh, two thousand and nine onwards. Um, so we tend to try to add value to a property. So we either look at commercial to residential conversions or um, houses to HMOs, um, high-end professional HMOs. So the idea is everything's all under one brand. Um, if a investor approaches us, we'll help them find a property that suits their criteria, uh, build it within a certain budget, uh, be able to let it help them on the refinancing through brokers like yourself, and then provide a management service to them. So it's, a, it's basically a full turnkey solution for investors yeah one of the things i think i find with with relative not not even relative newbies but but those that maybe don't have as much experience as others um in in our sector is that it's actually you, you've mentioned there's so many different facets to developing a property and it's really hard to almost become you know an expert overnight in every single one of them so having that sort of concierge service that you can provide because of the experience that you guys have got it, it's a bit of a no-brainer that you 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 know you're gonna you're gonna draw in people that want to work with you, right? No, definitely. So we we're, we're firm believers that if you want to be successful in life, you need to solve people's problems. Uh, one of the biggest problems out there is 
having this solution where you know you can take your money you can actually add value to what your investment uh pull a chunk of your cash back out and also be getting a return per calendar month so which is what we're actually doing for many investors and a lot of the we've got actually got two investors that are based in the uae that we've done this for uh, we've got one client now looking to sign on from singapore and that's been following us on social media so yeah i think it is beneficial but the, the key to our business is being able to solve uh, issues of uh, that our investors are facing yeah no i i, I mean to be honest it, it, it seems as though there's actually kind of a little bit of a, a crossover almost about sort of, sort of what we do because i feel like as much as i'm only i'm a lowly broker and i say lowly broker like that all the time all the time because um i seem to be quite low in the food chain to where uh, solicitors etc stand in the in the process but um you know there is there's there's it what we do is finding solutions for people and and that that's one of the hardest things to do because in a market such as this as well where actually things are changing quite rapidly and, and people are quite confused generally it's it's understanding you know the the, the full process and having that thirty thousand foot view of things that actually allows you to give that advice to people and offer a, a much better service i find and, and clearly because you've i guess because you've got so many different parts of the business you're able to to have that as you say kind of like one i don't like the term one stop shop but it is to an, to an extent so you've, you've been able to um you know get get clients or get people that are interested all over the world as a result of that i think it's all also i mean what what helps is obviously we've been in the property game for over 20 years now so the experience and you know not not every journey is a perfect journey even though right now we try and make out it is but we've had our you know our our fair bits of bumps if you like and and, and made mistakes and we've learned from it so um we also believe i mean and i think COVID has taught everybody that you need to have um you need to diversify in anything you do so it probably helps our business to have different streams of income which is what we do so we have the development side we have um the managing side and um as we spoke earlier we have a funding side of the business as well so um it's i think with the experience that we have and we're we're generally trying to help people out there to to get on board, which is why we've 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 now partnered up with with um, various banks as well, just to try and help first time developers get on board. As you know, it's quite difficult to get finance for first time developers with no experience. But coming to Savoy, is, it is like a one stop shop because we can help people. Yeah, it's funny actually that you say that because obviously one of the things that I I talk to my clients about that don't necessarily have the experience is leveraging the experience of others. And I guess when you if someone comes to you and they have got um they don't necessarily have the experience but they've got you guys there you know and actually having them on their property cv as you know so boys are here basically running the show it kind of actually from a lender's perspective takes a lot of the um or it gives them a lot of comfort takes away some of the risk of lending to a first-time developer because they know that they've got um you know a group or a, you know a company such as yourselves they're actually, as I say, kind of project managing the whole thing from start to finish. And, and that in, that can be leveraged um, in terms of experience. And if you've also got those relationships with those banks as well, obviously they know you and you can almost act as almost like an intermediary, like a, um, a mediator between the two. And, and I guess it gives you the, the opportunity then to, to maybe help those that wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily have been helped previously. Yeah, no, 100% agree. Um with with many of our clients we've you know they, they want to be they want to get into investment but they don't have the experience and so they as you said they are leveraging from us but by doing the one deal with us they actually gain the experience and then when they come back to the likes of yourselves they'll be able to go to a wider range of lenders second time round. so it's uh, just helping people get that uh, first step to, on the ladder towards uh, development. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know, I, I say to clients all the time, it's a little bit like a ladder when it comes to finance. You know, you've got to, you start at the bottom and, and my job is really to help them progress up and and ultimately have access to high street banks that can that can lend to them on a development basis and it's, and it's the cheapest around. But you can't, you have to qualify, you know, for that. You have to, you have to get there. You've got to earn your stripes, so to speak. So no, it's good, it's good to hear that, that there's other, it's not just me that understands this process. There's others in there as well. Um, 
obviously uh what one thing i definitely wanted to ask you uh was when i was thinking about stuff that, that i i wanted to get your take on before we even we even started this i'm very open with with the fact that this podcast yeah i love it the fact that loads of people listen to it but it's mainly just for me so i can talk to people that i want to talk to um and one of the things that um obviously you've got a uh, you've you've got a great experience of you know of two decades working in this industry we're in such a weird place property wise right now um there's there's so many i don't think i've ever seen it this way where so many commentators are telling us that there's a housing crash coming but all the indicators are predict are showing us that that is probably unlikely to happen. I'd love to get your your guys' viewpoint on on actually the state of the, the housing market and the property market at the moment, and where you probably see it going over the next maybe couple of months to couple of years. Sure. Um, well, I think our time in property for probably over those last twenty years, we've never seen the market such as this. Even times when there was booms, uh, sort of mid two thousands, uh, like. There were still readily available properties and sellers were realistic at the moment. Um, we're finding that people are putting properties out 50k more than what maybe the last property in that street sold for several months ago. And, and it's actually achieving that extra 50k as well. Whether it actually whether the value has come in at that amount is a, another question. Um, what we what we found in so 20 years of experience is our opinion is the property market has sort of a is a 10 year cycle so you seven years of it is relatively flat but then during those other three years you may have double digit growth within there um just looking back at from those 20 years that we've been in property every 10 years house housing prices have doubled and rents have uh doubled over 20 years so it's um it's a it's it's a very uh, unusual time for us because I was having a look at stats. So the area that we operate in, London Borough of Hillingdon, um, houses back in 20, uh, February 2020, 280 transactions happened that month. But if we look at February 2022, only around 80 transactions completed that month. So we technically got a third, third less properties are actually selling buoyant demand. So you've got housing price inflation at uh, 10%. So uh, people have money they want to put in the property, but there's there's hardly anything on the market. It's a, it's a very difficult time to try to get deals. And the only way that we're able to find some is leveraging uh, partnerships, uh, friendships, uh, relationships that we've have within the industry, just to try to find it. And every property that we look at, we always look at now, okay, is there an, an angle that another investor may be missing on this? So we can just utilize some uh, potential growth there that will offset some of the increase in uh, purchasing prices. Yeah, Sandy, did you did you have any uh, anything to add to, to what Malkit said there, or is he is he basically just do you, do you agree on everything? <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Um, <laughs> no, I, I I do. I mean, me and me and Malkit speak about this all the time, so um, we always have to work together and try and work out a plan um i think i think the market is i mean it is it is um a bit crazy at the moment to be honest with you because like you said people are predicting a crash but if you look at the stock on the market there's nothing then whatever comes up is literally after, after a few days is under offer um at the asking or above so um it is it is a a tough time for people like us as developers to go out there and try and get stock and as market says we're just you know um, utilizing the connections that we've made and the relationships that we've had for you know um over 20 years and just trying to get deals but even then it's not as easy as as one would like it to be no absolutely i mean that's i guess one, one of the situations i find myself in um obviously as a broker is obviously our, people are coming to me with deals that they need financing so i i kind of say to myself that i'm in a bit of a peculiar section of the market where i'm constantly seeing deals so i'm like oh there's deals everywhere you know there's because there i'm getting calls every day with people saying i need to finance this deal but actually all the stats are are pointing to the fact that we have probably one of the biggest supply and demand deficits that maybe we've ever had well maybe in the last 50 years at least um which is the one of the biggest 
reasons why property prices will start to increase because obviously competition is is so so rife but then in addition to that we probably have more liquidity in our lending market that we probably ever have ever have had either i think something somebody told me last year there was over a trillion pounds worth of available um funding in in the uk which is just unprecedented and of course okay we've had bank of england base rate rises recently which have made some residential mortgages slightly unaffordable for certain people but on the whole traditionally um you know when you look historically we we, we still have incredibly cheap money as well and actually um one thing i found recently was that with the most recent base rate rise which um you know time of um time of recording this is uh, sort of third week march we um, we expected all the lenders just to follow suit with what they did previously and just start rising uh, raising rates pretty much immediately and there's been some relatively significant players in the market that have actually come out and said that they're not going to pass on the the rate rise in their standard variable rates um you know over the next couple of weeks so that i think to me as well shows a real positivity from lenders to to try and you know help first time buyers in particular residential buyers in particular um and hopefully that will that will be positive but that only aids um you know a a buoyant property market right you know we've got supply and demand issues loads of money to lend you know when when's this when's this going to stop you know at what point is the bubble going to burst i think that's the, uh, the million dollar question um from from looking at the fundamentals so you've got low interest rates you've got how inflation which then means you've got housing price inflation i can only see this year with prices rising um and you have to also look at the fundamentals like um obviously we're within london uh london needs i think eighty three thousand new rental properties a year just to keep up with demand um there's a chronic housing shortage um I think now to get more affordable accommodation, people are basically just following like the Crossrail or maybe the, the new HS2 line and just moving further out with the mm -hmm. ability to move into travel into London. Um, so I think for, for the next couple of years, you're only going to see prices get higher. I do know that a lot of people say it's only a matter of time before the inevitable happens, which is uh, a correction. But you have to look at the stats for why you would have a correction. and just looking at at the moment with the cheap money the low interest rates um uh, rising costs of everything i think housing is a pretty safe bet for the next few years yeah i i completely agree with that actually and and this is um, a couple of things to pick up on on what you what you just said there which is firstly to talk about the the the, the need in the rental market so i'd love to get your viewpoints on why the government seems to hate landlords so much um, um, and secondly, a, a very, very unpopular viewpoint that I have as a Londoner that has actually moved up to the West Midlands. So obviously, I speak to a lot of people up here now about it, which makes it even more unpopular, um, is that obviously we as a as a country, and particularly, I think, in, in the capital, because I do I do truly believe that London is the financial capital of the world. Um, and as a result, we have and, and as a result of lots of different things like our inability to build up, our inability to build out. Um, the price of property in London just keeps going up and up and up and up and up. Um, and it is seen as an international commodity. You've obviously got that firsthand experience of dealing with people that are in, interested in investing in property from all over the world. You know, UK, UK and particularly London property, real estate, is seen as a, an incredible, you know, asset and an amazing international investment, isn't it? And actually with the government, um, you know, kind of putting a, a few things in place to make it more difficult for those abroad to be able to invest in in the UK in my humble opinion it, it's almost a bit sad that you know obviously we we do have we don't have enough housing they want to put things in place you know it's a popularist policy for you know the government to want to say that we're trying to help the you know people in the UK buy their homes and everything like that but a it's not for me it's not a god-given right that you should own your own home and and secondly you know it's a it's a really amazing opportunity that we have to drive money into our country by by you know allowing those from around the world to buy buy property um would you would you agree with with that or am, am i getting a little bit carried away there um yeah i i would uh, i would agree with that but you have to also look at where where these foreign investors are putting parking their cash is, is typically zone one mm -hmm. um 
like the likes of myself, we li we live in the the outer zone. So, so is it, is having this foreign investment coming in and buying prime real estate having an impact on the average person within London? I would say no. Um, <clears throat> I think the the real issues with um, housing and the lack of housing is just down to uh, n uh, national government policies and uh, local councils as well, because our opinion is um, councils actually effectively act like planning control. Their their job is more to to pe appease the the locals as opposed to solve the housing crisis that they have. Um, and issues such as um, the the local councils and governments not making any um, uh, social housing and then relying on um, private builders to actually build it and then not only build it but then provide it for free for for the government is also having a, a knock-on effect we see this firsthand where maybe a site can easily fit 14 flats but the builder will only build nine because he knows if he goes to 10 or above then he needs to give 20 30 percent away for free to the local council mm. so i think to, to solve this housing crisis it actually needs to come from national go uh, government and then it needs to filter down to the local councils yeah no i i, I tend to agree with that there, there seems to be a uh not a, there's a disparity um from from local from local to central isn't there massively and obviously you mentioned earlier on there as well this need actually for for rental properties and this is this is where everyone talks about oh you know we we, we, we need to build houses we need to be um, so that so that people can buy property as i said earlier i i have a, a very unpopular view that it's not your anyone's god-given right to own a property you have to earn that right um but to have a to have a home to have a roof over your head you know many people would see that as a as a true fundamental and if there is isn't even enough rental stock available to satisfy that need that's a real problem but it seems to me as though the government really aren't understanding that and they're putting so many sanctions on private you know small-time private landlords in particular um that actually nowadays are not the fat cat landlords that everyone you know has, has seen over the years um they are genuine people that want to build and, and create fantastic living environments for their tenants and what i just sometimes scratch my head when i see you know tax increases and, and whatnot happen because i think why why are you stifling this you know the, the this this particular growth um obviously you guys as as builders um i'm i'm interested to know kind of what your viewpoints are in terms of that that rental market you know are the government you know causing a bit bit of a problem here in terms of um you know stifling rental stock so it's i, I think being a landlord has been pretty tough with all the legislation tax changes and so on that have come in uh, section 24 has had a massive impact, but those that are taking accountancy advice and so on have been able to mitigate most of it by incorporating. I think the government did this for several reasons. One, to show that they're actually taking a stance against the uh, landlords because we're moving from being a nation of homeowners to a nation of renters. It's going to happen over the next course of 10 years. And the current government didn't want to say that, you know, they actually encourage this because now their, their voting base is actually going to be renters. So they want to show that they've actually done that. I think the other point the government wanted to make was normally at the end of the year, you just fill in two pages on the self-assessment in regards to your uh, property portfolio that you may, may own in personal names. And it's very difficult for them to, to work out whether you're telling the truth or not. And they just have to take it at face value now when once you've got once you become incorporated you're filling in a, a lot more detailed balance sheet and you know profit and loss and so on so if there's if you if you have been telling fibs it'll be quite easy to to work it work it out so um so i think the government's probably raising more tax as a result of those changes as well um but we are going to move to a nation of renters it's just from just looking at the stats it's inevitable uh, just just down to like from our perspective just trying to get planning permission approved on bits of land and so on that we've had or even existing buildings um, we had one case where the government brought in this right where it was technically considered uh, prior, prior approval to put two floors onto a, a block of flats and then we've tried that um, the local council failed it you know we went to appeal and the planning inspector agreed with local council that it'll be out of 
uh, uh, due to the size of it, it'll be out of the, um, the 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 street scene. So, so it's so even when the government are trying to bring in changes to try to make uh, a positive impact, it's it's not really having that uh, when it gets filtered down to local council uh, uh, planning level. It just, I guess, the, these sorts of things don't necessarily happen. I guess overnight, do they? Um, I like, I like your. The, I think you're the first person that I've spoken to that's actually used that terminology that we're moving to a nation of of renters rather than than, than homeowners. And I'm hoping that, like with a number of different things, when it comes to you know the generations moving along, that hopefully, and I do, I think that maybe we're in the in the first generation of it now, where actually the need to own your own home has kind of changed. That that's that that mindset has changed a little bit now, and actually people aren't as bothered um i mean me myself i moved up to the west midlands just before lockdown um we i said to the missus at the time look you know i don't want to i don't want to buy anything because what if i don't like the area i've never lived outside of london before i i, I just want to make sure that i like it we moved into a, a flat you know we, we rented lockdown came along and we're still here and actually we've had so many discussions over the last couple of weeks about you know should we buy a house and actually there's only the two of us plus a couple of little cats we're quite happy here you know it's a really nice little area it's a really lovely flat and actually i've got no even with what i do i'd rather go out and buy you know a ton of properties as, as part of an investment portfolio i've got no real inclination right now to go out and buy my own home so maybe if i'm thinking that in terms of actually what i do for a living maybe that's filtering down into into the you know into joe blogs on the street and uh and i actually think that'll probably benefit us a little bit because we're never going to we're never ever in a million years and this massive changes are made going to hit our um our targets that the government have been setting for years and years and years in terms of building houses so actually if we're not going to hit them and we've got no chance of hitting them what's the point of setting them in the first place let's just be realistic and look at a, a way of making the country better and if that means that we actually focus more on making sure that those that rent get a really good quality standard of living and, and you know that the landlords are doing what they should be doing etc cetera, etc cetera, then maybe that's where the focus needs to be so i'll get off my soapbox now um <laughs> um but sandy did you have anything to, to add on that no, i was going to say you're absolutely right i think i think what you're saying is but the government's never going to say that right so let's let's, let's be honest <laughs> they're never going to say that so but but no i think you hit the nail on the head i think you're absolutely right um, guys, one thing I wanted to—I was really keen to to ask you. Oh, sorry, Malky, okay, you were gonna you were gonna jump in with that. That was me with my big mouth. I, I was just gonna say um, one one thing that I can actually see maybe as a benefit of what is actually happening and with the impacts of COVID is uh, infrastructure software has improved in terms of you can work from anywhere, um, which will also allow more flexible living. So you don't necessarily need to be in London. You can actually say, okay. Sam, Sam's in the Midlands uh, for maybe a couple of years, but then afterwards, I'm just going to, do you know what, I'm going to go to the Lake District, live out there because, you know, it'll be quite nice. I, I met uh, an interior designer and she said um, she basically just every year or so, she just moves, be in Portugal or now now I'm in Geneva and I'll, I'll choose somewhere else because is it, I can work from anywhere. So she's doing some housing projects in London and she'll come maybe once a month to London um, but you know she's got this flexibility of being able to live anywhere in the world and you know also benefit from that yeah Do you know it's, it's funny the uh, we we me and my wife went uh, we had our honeymoon in Canada which is a, a beautiful part of the world if you ever get the opportunity to go people are lovely food's great countryside's amazing beers actually not too bad either so that's always good um, but ever since we've been back, she's been saying, come on, Sam, let's just go and move. Let's move to Canada. You can do your job for anywhere. And it's weird because everything you've just said about it is absolutely true. And and this this person, obviously, you, you know, she really is kind of living the four hour work week type life, isn't she? And, it, and it's it's amazing. Um, and I know, I know that it's possible. You know, I'm sitting here right now. You guys are, are down south. I'm in I'm in the Midlands. We're having this conversation as if we were sitting around the table together. So it's it's clear that that these the, it can be done but there's still something weird and nagging in my mind that's saying oh, i'm not quite ready ready for that yet i need that access you know to the team and and to see some to to be face to face with people as often as i possibly can so yeah i i, I like i said i i know that what you're saying is true it's i don't know i'm i'm not quite there yet it's strange 
you've got to embrace change sam make it make the change do it i know and do you know what i i, I genuinely do i i'm quite a i'd like to think of myself as a forward thinking person and i'm always especially within within grand union and the other businesses that i'm involved with i'm always trying to think of the way the best way to make the whole thing work efficiently using technology you know whatever it might be um but yeah for, for some reason i'm still i i, I think i've always been such a face-to-face -face person that I, I maybe i, I struggle with it. the idea of being halfway around the world uh when i just want to come in and 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 talk to people face to face that's what i struggle with i don't quite believe you if you um sam because if you were we'd be sitting right in front of you right now but you're actually embracing technology without even realizing that you're actually embracing it yeah no look you're right you're right i uh but <laughs> yeah i think it's, it's it's this kind of stuff i love you know i love the fact that we can do podcast episodes and things like that and and i can i and i've actually um last year on my podcast i had a couple of people that were based in america you know and and i never would have been able to do that you know previously so that's the kind of stuff i think it's the it's that whole i i love um i love interacting with my team i think that's what it is it's, for me it's more of a selfish and, and more of a personal thing so you know, I, I like to actually go down to London a couple of times a week, um, see, you know, see and speak to the team and and have that face to face and personal interaction with them. And um, although, you know, having said that, I very, very rarely even see clients face to face. I, you know, I come on Zoom calls and whatnot to do that. And I think that's where a lot of I think that's where the interconnectivity you know, internationally and nationally is, is happening a lot. But I actually think that from a from a from a business perspective, from a from a team building perspective, it is nice so that 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 a a group of people that work within a company, which is what you know the, the word company stems from, is a group of people with with this you know similar goal, is is actually the ability to have everyone together at some point. You know, it might not be every single day, but maybe once or twice a week. Um, I still think that's a massively important thing. I think there are things that you can do face to face that. That you know the idea, the, the the bouncing out of ideas, the the bouncing off each other in terms of you know just having if I know what it's like working in sales most of my life. You know you're in an office, somebody's standing up and they're they're getting you know excited on the phone. You kind of feed off that energy, um, and I think that's what I would massively miss. And I do I think that we're moving to a, to a, um, a state where remote working is the norm. Whether it becomes the norm as a full time thing. I'm not too sure. I think people still crave that, especially after all the lockdowns and stuff we've had. I think people crave that human interaction that um, as much as there is, you know, the metaverse and all this stuff that, that's coming about, I don't think there's ever going to be something that can beat face to face. And look, you guys are, are almost testament to that with some of the events that you've been putting on recently. You know, you are bringing together, you know, a really great um, group of people. Uh, so I guess to a certain extent, surely you're, you're advocates of that, you know, that face to face and that, that physical interaction. Absolutely. I think, I think it's nice to have a balance though. I think, I think, you know, like we're on a um, call now, um, we're on stream yard. So, or that or zoom or whatever you're doing. I think, I think it's, it's taking advantage of those, um, applications when you can, and also having the face to face interactions as well. It's very important. So I think what 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 market said and touched on is is we are changing the way that we are working you know offices are downsizing companies are cutting costs productivity is more when people are working from home because what's happening actually is people are working from home not switching off so instead of leaving at 4 30 before five o'clock they actually stay until six seven o'clock mm. because they're comfortable their own home so i think it's i think it's worked well for companies i never thought it would personally um that was my personal opinion. I thought people would be more lazy just sitting at home, you know, watching a bit of TV and not not really, you know, doing doing a lot of work. But it's actually gone the other way. I think you're absolutely correct, though. It's it's nice to have the face to face interactions. It's important um, for for a company and for us, you know, as as being the owners and the employees, just everyone to get together and you know um, talk around a table or or over lunch or wherever it is. It is very very important. I think Mark wanted to add something to that. No, um, just following on from uh, Sanjay, I think social integration is something that's required uh, for us. We have so many people that message us saying, okay, can you, it'd be great to meet over a coffee and so on. It's basically the reason why we said, okay, maybe every, well, every quarter this year we'll host an event, we'll get everyone down, we won't actually charge them, you know, so it's a free event, we'll make it of some value, so we'll combine it with something that's linked to property but not actually property itself so our q1 event was watches of switzerland so most people that do well in property uh invest in a watch which they also consider as an asset 
our next event we're going to announce it but it's going to be linked to cars so it's again something that's uh quite s closely associated but, supercars <laughs> yeah supercars i didn't want to give too much away just yet um yeah so it's it, it's actually quite nice so we so we, with us being on social media for the past two years we've interacted with obviously the likes of yourself sam and others and it's actually nice to just get everyone in one place and just have a have a chat with them and you don't know where that chat will lead um uh, we've ended up uh, doing some collaborations uh with octane and some other companies as a result of face-to-face -face, um chat so we're strong advocates of it but i think in the you also at the same time need to embrace technology as well yeah, do you know what? I, I I completely agree. And this actually leads me quite nicely onto what I was I was gonna gonna sort of talk to you about. So obviously, in the last couple of years since the voice has, has has come about, you have massively. I mean, I don't know whether this was purely because of COVID and it was the main way of being able to you know tell the world about what you're doing. But you've massively embraced social media as a marketing tool, um, and now you're having your, your face to face events. Um, I mentioned in the intro as well, you're obviously heavily involved in Watford Football Club as well. How, how much, I mean, for, for me as a business owner, I can see, you know, the massive benefits of, of doing all this kind of stuff. But maybe for somebody that is just starting out, that's looking and seeing how, how what you're doing online and, and also now in sort of face to face and, you know, working you know, with someone with a, a team like, like Watford, for example, what, what is the what is the, the whole point of doing that? Um, because somebody listening in that is relatively new to all this might be thinking, are they just doing it as kind of to show off? I know that's not the case, but you know, there's obviously a really good reason behind the strategy that you've you've employed there. So uh, we initially used um, Instagram as just a, a place to which just a photo dump, just show a project through the course of uh, its say six month conversion from from start. And you'll have some weekly updates on it and then you'll see it completed um, and the whole purpose of it was just basically for our clients because when we used to meet them on site so they'll be like oh can you show some uh current projects and you'll be like flick 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 of a property and they're swiping across and then, then there's a picture of your child um hey. so we wanted um, a bit more of a reliable and um accessible way of just storing photos so we started using instagram for that but then what we weren't well what, what we didn't expect was the feedback that we was actually received so r random people were saying oh that's really nice what are you doing with this and you know and it started this integration um and what we wanted to do with anything that we do so whether it's uh, a network event or whether it's social media anything that we put our name or brand to, we want to make it a reflection of who we are. So with like myself and Sanjay, we're quite consistent. You know, we're, we're, we're on it all the time. So every day we're adding something that is of value to ourselves and our business. And I wanted our social media to be reflective of that as well. So it's, it's consistent. It may not be everyone's cup of tea. It's like building work and then anything that's happening within social media. Um, and, if anyone else is looking to do it, then just make that reflective of yourself. So you don't necessarily have to copy anyone else, just be you. Yeah, Sanjay, anything to add on that? I think he hit the nail on the head, mate. He's, he's a social media guy, so he knows what you're talking about. Uh, okay, okay. So now, 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 we're, now we're now we're seeing you know the, the roles within within the company. Market, you're the you're you're the, you're the the tech the tech social guy. I just, well, again, it was just something during lockdown where we were just posting it up and we were just learning. And it's, it's quite interesting when you've got something new. So you either start, I see so many people that start up, maybe uh, a HMO sort of group or a developer, and they post for a few months and then they'll just stop and never use it again. I think if you're going to do something, be consistent. And the key to our success is never giving up. Just keep going, keep going, because, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel. You can't, I think too many people now are too concerned with this overnight success. Okay, look, I'm going to start putting out, I want 10,000 followers, I want 50,000, whatever. But myself and Sanjay, when we speak to others, we're like, do you know, the main bit that you actually enjoy is when you actually started off, like your first deal, your first development, and, you know, like getting it financed and then getting it refinanced and so on. 
that's the actually enjoyable bit you know not you don't really look at something polished right at the end you know and you think yeah i'm really grateful you actually enjoy you have to enjoy the whole process of it so i think a lot of people need to, to understand that yeah don't worry about how many followers or whatever you've got because at the end of it it's your properties that are going to be paying you you know you don't last thing you want is no properties but a bunch of followers yeah, yeah. No, I, I, absolutely and funnily enough I, I say this to people all the time because i'm sure uh, you know i get questions very similar to, to yourself in terms of you know i i, I kind of need to do something similar and need to build a bit of a presence online i think it's majorly important i think it's fundamental of any business now to have you know real strong quality online presence with a with a good quality brand to go with it but it doesn't you know it's that whole start now get perfect later scenario i think when it comes to, to this type of marketing um when i look back over some of the posts that i did you know two or three years ago when i really started using online marketing as a, as a tool for myself and when i say online marketing I actually very rarely sell and i know you guys as well you know you just post about what you do and i'm the same i'm just giving people updates i actually said to somebody um somebody said to me oh you're so egotistical all you do is go online and just you're just trying to get business constantly i said go and have a look at my posts find a post where i say tell somebody to use me as a broker i guarantee you won't find one um i'm sure there might be like a snippet in there somewhere where i've mentioned it but you know for me it's all about just just documenting what you're doing and those that are just just starting this and they are concerned like you, you said market oh i haven't got ten thousand followers or i want ten thousand followers or 15 or 20 or whatever it might be they're just you know they're just um ego matrix they're not they, they're not actually going to fuel your business and actually people are probably going to be quite surprised with how few genuine followers you need to actually fuel a business in terms of creating a lead source for yourself um you know my my entire business which is you know multi six figure now in a cup in over you know two years of being in less than two years of being in existence is fueled almost up 100 by instagram um and and the existing clients the existing contacts that I, I previously had and now a little bit from youtube as well it's an incredible resource but i don't have millions of followers um it's just that i i i have enough that fuels my my business and that's all that's all that you need so i think you're absolutely right market i think there's a lot of people that get into into this and and they see people with the flashy cars people with the the, the, the you know the sparkly new properties that they're they're doing video tours of and whatnot but actually it's the it's that's not what it's all about it's about actually documenting showing the tough times showing what you're doing because that ultimately will then start bringing interest into what you do you can highlight the knowledge that you have and ultimately that will bring potential customers, potential JV partners, potential investors your way, and it will give you credibility to enable you to, to bring those people into your sphere and actually be able to work with them. And, and clearly you've, you've had success in doing that. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Uh, I'd like to point out myself and Sanjay, despite being in property for 20 years, we're yet to borrow any money from anyone. We've yet to, to, to mentor anyone. We yet to do any courses. Um, and, people when we say that to people they say well what's wow how is that i said well i'm not we're not like any other property developer i said why why is that i said well we try to actually make money by doing property you know like i think uh, myself and sanjay during lockdown we did we, we started a project in lockdown one finished it in lockdown three and we made seven figures off one deal um which we won a award for as well for being um uh, property developer of the year under five million from the, the last property investor awards but the purpose is just to be a reflection of yourself so we we yet to sell anything on there all we're just doing is highlighting what we're doing and anyone that comes to us you know we we speak to them humbly you know show them what we do and we see whether we can actually help them there's people that have approached us and said well uh, you know with what you've just put across uh not in terms of finances but in terms of realistic expectations of what you're going to put in and what you're going to get back out you know i don't think we can actually help you with that um and for for ourselves myself and sanjay in terms of developments we're only probably looking to do maybe 10 or 12 client developments a year so we only need to actually get one customer per month just to hit our targets yeah and that's do you know what that, that's exactly it and this is what i was saying earlier on about how in terms of the presence that you need online people will be quite surprised with actually how 
how small a, a presence is actually required in order to to, to keep it and get a business going because they see all of these you know, influencers with millions of followers. Um, but I bet you they'd be quite surprised with actually how little some of these these people make. They've got these, they're quite good at taking great pictures of themselves, but maybe not quite so good as converting that into genuine value that that can result in, in running a business. So it's good that um, that we agree on that because otherwise that'd be difficult. But um, but it, yeah, it's just, it's just great to see. And I have to say, you know, I'm not just blow, blowing smoke up your ass. It's, it's what you do is great. And I really, really enjoy, um, you know, the content that you're putting out. It's, it's good for, for someone like myself to see. I, lo I love to see it. So I, I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for that, Sam. Uh, guys, before I let you go, I wanted to ask you one one last thing because I'm always interested in this thing because I've got so I don't know if you know this I, I'm a big rugby fan and I harbour ambitions of um, getting quite significantly involved in Saracens, which is my team that I support at some point in the future. Um, and uh, I know your your friends over at Shawbrook uh, are already there, so I might have to elbow them out of the way at some point. Um, but you've obviously recently become uh, involved in Watford Football Club. Um, I'm quite interested to to hear about how that came about and and why you chose to to get involved in a premiership football club apart from you know the obvious exposure that you can get um yeah i'd just love to to hear sort of your your thoughts and, and views on that as well yeah um so myself and sanjay growing up were massive football fans um uh, we're not watford fans but we we're liverpool fans but we what we wanted to actually do was um just just have some affiliation with with a club and a local club so we're from where both myself and Sanjay live. Uh, Watford's probably one of the, the closest Premier League clubs to us, sort of a 20 minute drive. And it was, we just wanted to to think outside the box and, and we approached them and uh, looked at a way that we could work together. One of the other key aspects is uh, both myself and Sanjay have uh, young sons. And, um, you know, I think within the industry, there's not many people that are from maybe uh, the same background as, as us within football. So um, it was a way of getting involved and showing some affiliation and also then providing, just becoming a little bit more role models to, to our children as well. Um, and as an added benefit, uh, the, our clients and business partners and stuff have uh, been enjoying uh, the hospitality at Watford Football Club over the this current season so it's um for us it's a win-win no good mate do, do you know what? i've i mean as a saracens fan um i've actually i've i've been to to vicarage road many many times changed a lot since i i've been there yeah, um nice. really there's, nice there's, there's lot lots going on but um you know, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story about vicarage road that might make you laugh um so back in the day when when saracens used to play at vicarage road we used to sit in the Rouse stand, which is which used to be sort of the main stand. I don't know if it is anymore, obviously, with all the development. Um, but there behind that, there would be like a little hospitality bar. Um, and again, don't know if it's still still the sort of the same set setup. But um, I don't want to get anyone into trouble here. So when I was a kid, my dad used to used to take me. We had a little group of us, so we'd go to these games. And every Christmas, my dad would basically there's this, there was this old boy working on the door of the hospitality, and he was there every single week, week in week out. And my dad would basically just slip him a little bottle of bottle of whiskey or something as a thank you. And he would let us in every single game for the entire season um, to go and, you know, enjoy a couple of pork baps, um, you know, a nice warm bar when it's peeing down with rain outside. Um, and that was that's one of my, my memories of that stadium is is that is <laughs> my dad, my dad, like it's always like a sneaky little deal. And this this old boy, I mean, hopefully he's still around, but he was, you know, this was probably over 10 years ago and 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 well maybe even more so actually and he was definitely in his sort of 60s 70s then um and that uh, you don't get you don't get that kind of stuff anymore i know that's naughty i know that's naughty. you can't be doing that now mate it's not gonna happen <laughs> yeah, no. anything, you can't be doing that i'll tell you one <laughs> one one great thing about vicarage road is it's actually one of the few probably football club premier league football clubs that is very family focused so um there's not many grounds where you feel like where you can actually take your kids to to a game but with vicarage road it is um everyone's so super friendly out there uh we've myself and sanjay have taken our families and they've uh they've thoroughly enjoyed it uh, okay. just on another note we're actually um maybe q3 we're, we're looking at potentially uh doing something at saracens 
Okay, okay. We can, yeah. we can, we can um, post you some videos or photos of it. Of our <laughs> 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 no, we'll invite you. We'll invite you down. Yeah. Oh, good, good, good man, good man. Do you know, Joe? I, uh, I actually, as I said earlier, with there uh, with Shawbrook's involvement with Saracens. Whenever I do, whenever I'm doing deals with them, I always sign my my emails off. You know, Sam Norris, lifelong Saracens fan. I haven't had the I haven't had the call yet for the uh, for the hospitality, but um, I'm sure it's it's just it's just a matter of time. I mean, I've I've got everything set up. I, I know I know exactly how much a box costs. I know exactly what every all the different tiers of hospitality at Saracens. So I'm just I'm biding my time. I'm I'm ready. Uh, one of my one of my clients actually knows the owner, so I'm waiting oh, for that intro, introduction as well. But you just got my my opinion is if you want to be involved in a club like that, like you have with Watford or or, or whatever whatever club it might be, is you just have to be ready. You have to be in the right position so that when the opportunity comes to get some kind of involvement um you know you're you're there and and ready ready to go so one day i mean I, I jokingly have said quite a few times that one day i'd love to own saracens but that's quite you know that's i'll probably be in my 60s or 70s by the time that happens you never know <laughs> you never know you never know Fingers crossed, Sam. thank you guys but look thank you also for, for for giving up your time this afternoon to come in and uh and have a chat with me i i have probably about five thousand other questions I could ask you, but I know you guys are busy, and I don't, I don't want to take up so much of your time. But, um, but obviously, we've had for those of you that are watching on YouTube, we've had the the Instagram flashing along the bottom of the screen. Um, Savoy's at Savoy's Properties. So if you're listening in on the podcast, be sure to go over and check out um, the guys over there. And and I mean, you've got sort of a couple of different um, accounts for for the lending side and and various other other parts as well. So that's all listed on. Savoy's Properties is like the hub, isn't it, for people to, to go and see what you're all about? That's right. Cool, cool. Well, look, guys, um, is there any any sort of closing things you want to say? Any, anything you want to uh, ask or tell, tell people about in terms of uh, reaching out to you or, or anything else you want to mention? Yeah, um, we're, we're quite active on um, Instagram. So obviously our details are flashing across the bottom uh, and LinkedIn. But if you've, if you've got any questions, you want to reach out, Drop us a DM. We're trying to get back to every message that we receive. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, look, guys, all, all it remains to say is that thanks again for coming on. Um, I found this fascinating. I really, really hope that everyone listening in has, has found it fascinating uh, too. And, um, yeah, look uh, look forward to hopefully getting some good feedback on this. And, and thanks again for your time. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for having us.